Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam takes precedence in the lives of the believers over their own lives. The life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more important for the mu'mineen than their own lives. He said sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in a hadith that is rigorously authenticated, وَلَذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ Taking an oath, I swear by him who holds my soul in his hand. لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ وَالِدِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ وَالنَّاسِ إِجْمَعِينَ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ None of you truly believe until I am more beloved to him than his parents, his children, and the whole of humanity. And the scholars of hadith, the muhaddithin, they say here, there's two types of love that is indicated in this hadith. The first type of love is a love that is based on the rational faculty. It's called hub aqli, that we love the Prophet ﷺ because we know that it's good for us to love the Prophet ﷺ. For example, somebody who just converts to Islam may not necessarily love the Prophet more than he loves himself, but he knows that he should. So the ulama, they use an analogy of a bitter pill, like someone who's sick, someone who's ill, someone who has a disease. He takes the pill because he knows it's good for him, because his rational faculty, the aql tells him, this is good for me. This is a type of love. But then through ma'rifah, through gnosis, through knowing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we come to love him. So this ma'rifah is converted into pure mahabba. So this hub aqli becomes hub imani, in which we love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anything, more than our parents, more than our own selves. And this is part of our aqidah. This is what we believe, that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is khayr al-khalqillah, and we love him more than anything. Imam Ali, karamallahu wajah. He said, kana sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, uh, he said the Prophet ﷺ was more beloved to us than anything, even more so than cold water. What's this analogy he's using? What is, what is cold water for the desert Arab? It symbolizes life itself. That they love the Prophet ﷺ more than life itself. This is someone who is annihilated in the love of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of God, I would prefer that Abu Talib becomes Muslim over Abu Quhafa. Who is Abu Talib? This is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his paternal uncle, the man who raised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who's Abu Quhafa? His own father. Abu Bakr is saying, I prefer that your uncle go to Jannah over my own father. This is what he's saying to the Prophet ﷺ. Why would he say this? Because the Prophet's happiness is his happiness. It would make the Prophet happier. When he used to laugh, ﷺ, the Sahaba would laugh. When he used to cry, the Sahaba would cry. There was a Sahabi named Khubayb ibn Adi, عنه, who was captured by the Quraysh, and he was put in prison in Mecca until the sacred months were passed. And then he was taken out to a place called Tan'im, where he was crucified. And the Quraysh were laughing at him as he was nailed to the cross deriding him, jeering at him, laughing at him, mocking him. And they said, don't you wish that Muhammad was in your place and you were home with your family resting? Khubayb said, I don't wish that a thorn pricked the finger of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. I don't wish that a thorn prick his finger. And then he said, Ya Allah, there is nobody here to convey my salam to your Habib. And while the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina Tul Munawwara at that time, sitting in a majlis with Zayd ibn Haritha and others, a feeling came over him as if he was receiving the tanzil from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah, ya khubayb. And they said, What happened? Your companion is being martyred right now in Mecca. And then Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who was not Muslim at this time, obviously, when he was in Mecca and he was witnessing this. He said, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا يُحِبُّ أَحَدًا كُحُبِّ أَصْحَابِ مُحَمَّدٍ مُحَمَّدًا I have never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of the Prophet ﷺ love the Prophet ﷺ. And Ghazwat Uhud, the Sahaba formed a human shield around him وسلم, And amongst them was a woman, a blessed woman, Nusayba bintu Ka'b radiallahu ta'ala anha, who picked up a sword and stood in front of an armed horseman. This armed horseman, Ibn Qami'ah, who had just killed Mus'ab ibn Umar, and now wants to kill the Prophet ﷺ. He stops dead in his tracks because there's a woman standing in front of him with a sword. This Jahali Arab who wants to kill the Prophet ﷺ, he has enough common decency not to strike a woman on the battlefield. 
Think about that. We have so-called first world nations right now dropping bombs on men, women, and children, sleeping in their beds. What kind of barbarism is that? This man will not strike a woman on the battlefield. He has enough chivalry not to do that. So he turns the blade of his sword over and he starts tapping her on the shoulder as if to say, get out of the way. She's not budging because she said, I turned around and the Prophet ﷺ is under siege. I'm not going to move. So he brings the sword down hard on her shoulder, fractures her clavicle and she falls and he goes around. And her son was there at the time named Zaid. And he comes running, Ummi, Umm, my mother, my mother. And what does she say to him? She says, get away from me and protect the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. An nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes precedence in the lives of the believers over their own lives. There's an ayah in the Quran called Ayatul Imtihan, the verse of examination, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرحيم. Say, if you love Allah, if you claim to love Allah, you have to follow me. Then will Allah love you and forgive you your sins. Allah is forgiving and merciful. Why is this called Ayatul Imtihan? Who's being tested? Who's taking the examination? Our own selves. We have to see where we fare on this test. Do we pass or do we fail? Do we love Allah? If we love Allah, are we, do we have ittiba of the Prophet ﷺ? Are we following him? Who are we following? Because that's whom we love. That's how you can tell. Do we have ittiba of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? Do we have i'tisam? Do we hold on? Wa'atasimu bihabilillahi jami'an. Do we hold on tightly with every ounce of our being to the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is interesting because there's a pseudo gospel going around America right now. And a lot of Muslims are buying into it. It's called the prosperity gospel. Basically says that the amount of love that God has for you is commensurate with the amount of money you have in your bank account. <clears throat> the more money you have, the more God loves you. That's not our theology. Don't be deluded into that. That's not our theology. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ يُحْبِبْ Present active justice. This is a result clause. If you love Allah, you have to follow me. Then will Allah love you. What is our base? What is What, what, what determines the level of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has on us? Is a measure of ittiba we have with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I want to look at this ayah a little more closely. Because we should have good tadabbur of the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Allah asks a question in the Qur'an. Don't you have deep reflection of the Qur'an? Allah begins this by saying, قُلْ Say, this is an imperative, fi'l amr, in its second person, masculine, singular, which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is very interesting. Sometimes the du'at, they go on a stage in front of like a Christian audience, and they'll say something like, did you know the name of Isa alayhi salam is mentioned more in the Qur'an than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They say 25 times. The Prophet is mentioned only five times. Four as Muhammad and once as Ahmad. But five more times the name Isa alayhi This is true. It's true. The name of Isa, his name is mentioned five more times. Right? But which servant is more honored? The one that the king is talking about in the third person who's not there or the one that the king summons to his throne room and speaks to him directly? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, Alam nashrah li Muhammadin sadra wa ma arsalna uh, Muhammadan illa rahmatan lil alameen. He could have said that. But what does he say? Wa ma arsalna ka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Kaful khitab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This shows the ta'zeem and the takreem of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Something to think about. In Surah, uh, in Surah At-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Wallahu rasuluhu ahakku an yurduhu. He says, Allah and His Messenger, it is more befitting that you please Him. This is very interesting. On the surface, it looks like it's incorrect grammar. And some of the Orientalists who don't know a lot of Arabic, they try to say, oh, there's a grammatical mistake here in the Quran because there's two subjects, Allah and His Messenger. But the pronominal suffix, right? The object pronoun is singular. It's third masculine singular. Al-Mufrad al-Ghaib. Who? It should be Huma because Allah and His Messenger. But it's singular. Why is it singular? Imam al-Qurtubi, he says, this demonstrates the very intimate relationship with, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Prophet's pleasure his pleasure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Prophet's obedience his obedience. Who says this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma yuti ar-rasul faqad ata'a Allah. 
Whoever obeys the messenger is obeying Allah. Why? Because the messenger and Allah are the same person? Of course not. This is unfortunately where some of our Christian friends, with all due respect, our Christian friends and neighbors, this is where they went into the impermissible in their theology. They're not the same people. They're not the same person. They're equal on the level of obedience and will, not in, on the level of ontology. No one shares in the, the essence, the attributes and the actions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ عَصَى اللَّهُ كما قال, Whoever obeys me, obeys Allah. Whoever disobeys me, disobeys Allah. فَاطِمَةٌ بِدْعَةٌ مِّنِّي فَمَنْ أَغْضَبَهَا فَقَدْ أَغْضَبَنِي وَمَنْ أَغْضَبَنِي فَقَدْ أَغْضَبَ اللَّهُ Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Whoever makes her angry, angers me. Whoever makes me angry, angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a close personal relationship they have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was a, there was a break in the revelation after the first uh, Iqra was revealed and then a few verses of Surah Al-Qalam and then there was a, the Fatra, there was a break in the revelation. Imam al-Suyuti says 15 days, khamsata ashar yawm, that the revelation did not come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the mushrikeen started making fun of him. They started saying to him, about him, inna rabbahu wa da'ahu wa qalahu. That his Lord has forsaken him and hates him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a beautiful surah, wa taking an oath, the oath formula, al-qasam, is one of the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the early Meccan surahs will use as a tool of consoling his Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I swear by the morning light. And Imam At-Tabari says, this means the revelation. It also means the face of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a sound hadith. Anas ibn Malik said when the Prophet would enter into a room, the walls of the room would be eliminated. They would reflect his light. Wadduha. By his face, by the revelation. Wallayli ida saja. Imam at tabari said this means the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. Because where did he receive the tanzil, the Quran? Ala qalbihi bi idhnillah. Upon his heart. Now the heart is still because the revelation is not coming. Wallayli ida saja. In other words, whether you're receiving revelation or not receiving revelation, ma wa ma your Lord has not forsaken you and does not despise. And this is the right way to translate. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at this ayah, the verb qala is a transitive verb. We have to start learning these things. It's very important. We have to learn our scripture. Other people learn our scripture. Non-Muslims learn scripture. Non-Muslims, they go learn Farsi and Arabic and Urdu to do God knows what. What are we doing? Oh, it's too hard, brother. I can't do it. Where do you have your degree? I have a master's from UCLA. MashaAllah, you're a genius. You can't learn Arabic a little bit? Qala is called fi'l muta'addi. A transitive verb. Means you need to have a direct object. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say qala ka. He did not say he doesn't hate you or despise you. He left off the calf because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never even suggest that he hates the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even when he's negating the statement. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We read the Quran. There's multiple levels of meaning in the Quran. Jafar al-Sadiq says there's four levels of meaning to every verse in the Quran. There's the expression. There's the illusion. The, what it alludes to. And then there are subtleties. Lata'if. And then there are haqa'iq, there are realities. Like a verse we read that we think is just one dimensional. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commanding the qibla to be changed. What's the story behind this ayah? We read it over and over again, we don't even think about it. We don't have tadabbur of the Quran. We have to have tadabbur. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happened in the, the context of this story? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day, he cast a glance to the sky. He cast a glance to the sky. And he had shawq in his heart. He had a longing or a desire. He didn't even articulate it. What was his desire? That the Qibla be changed to Mecca, which is the first house of worship. In The first house ever dedicated to the worship of the one true God was in Mecca, in Becca. It's another name for Becca, for Mecca. Becca or Mecca. Becca is mentioned in the book of Psalms, 84.6 in the Hebrew Bible. It says in the Hebrew, passing through the valley of Mecca. So this is what he had in his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَا Revelation comes down. قَدْ حَرْفَ تَحْقِيق Indeed, نَرَى We see. Why we? Allah is Ahad. Allah is Wahid. Wahid means one. 
right? One person, one nafs. He refers to himself as nafs. كَتَبَ الرَّحْمَانَ عَلَى النَّفْسِهِ rahma. Ahad means he's one of a kind. So why is he saying we? This is called nunu ta'zim, jamun maliki, the royal plural. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a royal plural in verbs, the object, the person he's addressing also has ta'zim according to the people of grammar and rhetoric. Indeed, we see what we see you turning your face. What he ka? Who is ka? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Fissama, towards the heavens. Falanuwaliyannaka. How do we translate this? Impossible to translate. Lam of Tawqeed, Noon of Tawqeed, Noon of Ta'zim, Kaful Khitab. We're going to translate, indeed, indeed. Maybe that's a good translation. I don't know. Indeed, indeed. We will turn you, Qiblatan Tarda, to a Qibla that you are pleased with. Think about it. Allah changed the Qibla because the Prophet Wasallam one day he cast, a, he cast a glance to the heavens with shawq in his heart. And immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He changes the qibla. This shows a very close, intimate relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Habib sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. فَوَلِّ وَجْحَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ So turn your face in the direction of the inviolable masjid. Now watch what happens here. وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّ وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَ Therefore, wherever you all are, what happened? This is called iltifat in rhetoric. Again, the Orientalist is thinking there's a grammatical error in the Quran here. It changed from the singular wajhika to the plural wujuhakum. There is an error in the no. It's called iltifat. What happened here? Now Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is speaking to the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So not only does this ayah show a close relationship between Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and His Habib, but also between Al Habib sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is us. He said, because some, some of our Muslims, they say the Prophet ﷺ is a delivery man. He delivered the news and then he's gone. You don't see him again, you don't hear from him again. They've bought into the Rand Corporation. The Rand Corporation, a right-wing extremist group. This is how they want to give us our hermeneutics. How we want, how they're, they're presenting us some, something, a theology that the Prophet ﷺ does not have a transcendent nature. He's historical, he's gone, forget about him. And we're buying into this. If this is true, why did the Prophet say, he said, وَدِدْتُ لَوْ أَنِّي رَأَيْتُ إِخْوَانِي وَدِدْتُ From Mawadda, I would have loved to have seen my brethren. I would have loved to have seen them. The Sahaba said, aren't we your brethren? He said, no, you're my companions. Who are the brethren? Who are the Ikhwan? Those who come after me, who never saw me. But they're willing to sacrifice everything just to look at me one time. Why does the Prophet ﷺ keep reaching out to the Ummah if he's a delivery man and he's gone? You don't hear from him, or you don't contact him, nothing ever again. You don't care about him. He delivered the news, he's gone. This is what they want us to believe. Certain people in America, they're presenting this theology to us, and we're buying into it. This is not our theology. Imam al Sufki says, Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he couldn't stay in Medina, because everything reminded him of the Prophet So he went to Damascus. He was there for over a year. The Prophet comes to him in a dream. Ya Bilal, ma hadha al-jafa? What is this distance? What is this aversion? If he's a delivery man, why is he coming to the, the dreams of people? You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? In a mutawatir hadith, multiply attested hadith that you have to believe in, according to the majority of the ulama. And if you disbelieve in it, then we're in big trouble. He said, Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani fa inna shaytan la yatamathalu bi. Whoever sees me in a dream has truly seen me. Shaitan cannot imitate me. In, a, in another hadith in Bukhari, he says, Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'al haq. Whoever sees me in a dream has seen the truth. The Prophet ﷺ continues to reach out to his ummah. This means he's reaching out. Why? To establish that relationship. And this is done bi idhnillah. You have to understand. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. No one is giving divine qualities to the Prophet ﷺ. No one is saying that the Prophet ﷺ has omniscience and omnipotence. This is shirk, this is clear. No one is saying the Prophet ﷺ can see and hear all things. Of course not. But we have that relationship with the Prophet ﷺ. Bi idhnillah, there is neither strength nor power except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our theology. Imam Tirmidhi in his book Shama'il al Nabawiyah, which we all should read. Read this book, please. We need to have ma'rifah of the Prophet 
They get in touch with the Prophet ﷺ and love the Prophet ﷺ. He begins his book, 55 chapters. Babu ma ja'a fi khuluki Rasulillah. Babu ma ja'a fi khalki Rasulillah. The, the chapter concerning the physical attributes of the Prophet ﷺ. And you might say, why is this even important? A lot of Muslims will make this argument. Who cares what he looked like? What's his teaching? Who cares what he looked like? Then why did the Sahaba mention it? Khairu nas qarni. The Prophet said, the best generation is my generation. And the Sahaba, Khairun Nas, they described the Prophet ﷺ with such meticulous detail that Ibn Umar said, I counted 18 white hairs on his temple. Why is he doing that? Going up to him and counting white hairs on his temple. For what? Why do they record these things? Do you know why they recorded them? Because they loved him. ﷺ. This is why you describe these things. They were annihilated in his love. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His final chapter in his book of the Shama'il. Babu ma ja'a fi ru'yati rasulillah fil manam. The chapter on seeing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream. We forget about these aspects of our belief. Why does he structure his book like this? Because first chapter, you get to know about what he looked like. And then if you, if you study the book properly, you actually see him. That's the point of the book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us. In ittiba of Al Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa la alihi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in i'tisam of, 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 of grabbing on and seizing his book, the kitab of Allah, with every ounce of our being. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى ساداتنا وإمتنا أبي بكر عمر عثمان وعلي ورضي الله تعالى عن أصحاب رسول الله إجمعين يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد نقول وعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد الله سبحانه وتعالى he issues a warning in the Quran I'll end with this إن شاء الله he issues a warning in the Quran there's different types of ayat in the Quran different scholars have said there's seven types of verses in the Quran there's أحكام there's legal rulings that deal with the legislation of law, things that deal with, uh, you know, badaniya, things with the body, things that deal with the heart, the qalbiya, things with ibadah, that's one type of ayah. And then there's verses that deal with ma'ad, which deals with the afterlife or hereafter. And then you have qasas, you have stories or narrations. You have verses that talk about rububiya, theological verses, and verses that talk about uh, nubuwa, prophetological verses in the Qur'an. And then you have verses in the Qur'an that are wa'ad, which are promises, Promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقٍّ وَمَنْ أَسْتَقُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا And the promise of Allah is always true. The promise of Allah you can take to the bank and cash it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he has another type of verse called wa'id. And this is a threat. And we have to take the threat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, very seriously. Because a human being threatens us, we can't sleep at night. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 24, that if any of these ephemeral things, your houses, your bank accounts, your cars, your, your women and children, your husbands, your whatever it is, your, your, your houses, uh, your, your, what do they call them? Your summer homes, whatever you have, your stocks and bonds, if any of these things, if any of these things, أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَأْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ If any of these things are more dear to you than Allah, His Messenger, and struggling in His way, then just wait. We don't want to wait. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a wa'id. He issues a threat. We take the threat seriously. Very seriously. We submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We submit to the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let those be forewarned who go against the amr of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Lest a humiliating tribulation come to them or a painful punishment. They have no faith unless they make you the judge in all of their affairs. Unless they make you the judge in all of their affairs and they find no resistance in their hearts and they come to you with submission. Sometimes our submission 
right? Sometimes the aql, I should say, gets the better of our submission. We like to think we're smart. So-called postmodern Muslims, they say, oh, we're progressive now. We don't follow the way of the antiquated traditionalists who fast, they pray, they cover their heads. No, we're open-minded. We don't do these things, right? Fasting, that was for back then. This is going on in Western Academy amongst Muslims and other places as well. Fasting was for back then. You know, there was a shortage of food. So they had to fast one month every year. That's why they did it. There's shortage of food. Oh, making wudu, that's because they were dirty. This is what they say. What? Kutiba alaykum usiyam. You have to fast. This verse is mutlaq. It's unconditional. And it's am. It's general for all the Muslims. Sometimes our so-called intellect, we have to know that things are beyond our intellect. The Prophet wasallam end with this one minute, inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet wasallam was invited to a dinner party. And the host was a man named Abu Ubaid. And Abu Ubaid, he cooked a sheep because the Prophet wasallam likes to eat sheep, the shoulder. And the Prophet wasallam and he brought some other companions. He said, Now will at dira serve me the forequarter, the shoulder of the sheep. And he said, here you go, O Messenger of God. And the Prophet ﷺ, he took a few bites. He didn't eat a lot, wasallam. Did not eat a lot. And then he passed it to the Sahaba. And they take tabarruk from his leftovers. This is in the hadith. And then he said, now with me at dira, give me another shoulder. Here you go, O Messenger of God. And he took a few bites and he passed it to the Sahaba. And, he said, yeah, and, he, and then he said, yeah, yeah Abba Ubaid. Now will me at dira, give me a, a shoulder. Ya Rasulullah, wa kam lishati min dira. He said, oh, messenger of God, how many shoulders does a sheep have? How many shoulders? Right? Maybe he lost count. Listen to the response of the Prophet Sallallahu I swear by the one who holds my soul in his hand. Lo sakat. Lo sakat. Lana waltani at dira'ma da'ut. Oh, kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam. If you had just stayed quiet, you would have served me a shoulder every single time I asked you. Sometimes we have to have taslim. We just have to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognize that the intellect is in fact limited. Inshallah ta'ala.